Hello, and thank you for joining today's uh, Brown Bag Series webinar. Uh, really excited to have Greg Norris here to talk to us about uh, net positive sustainability, uh, a framework for transformative sustainable products, companies, and life in living. Sorry. Um, really appreciate folks for taking the time today. We've been running this series, uh, I think, about six weeks now, and it's really been great to see the attendance and, and people asking really good questions. Uh, throughout the series here. I uh, want to let everyone know logistically how you can ask questions. Uh, so throughout this process, you're, throughout the webinar, you're muted. Uh, but if you do have a question, there is a questions pane that you'll see. Uh, I guess it'll be on the right side of your screen. Uh, it'll allow you to type in a question. And throughout the, the process, if you have any technical problems, feel free to use that questions pane, and I'll respond directly to you. Uh, and at the end of the webinar, Greg will, will go ahead and answer those questions that you have for him during the, the discussion. Also want to let folks know that we record all of these sessions uh, and we do post them on our website. So if you have to step away uh, or you have a colleague that uh, you think might be interested in the topic, feel free to, to point them back to the website. With that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Greg. Greg, feel free to take over. Okay, Jim, thanks very much. Um, I'll echo your thanks to everyone who's uh, showing up today and um, really thank uh, Earthshift um, for putting on this really interesting series uh, and I think helpful series of, of brown bag webinars on different uh, life cycle related topics. And I'm just glad to have a chance to share some ideas and some uh, work in progress uh, with uh, all of you who can join today. Let me also uh, invite uh, Jim. I'm going to pause a few times during the presentation at sort of checkpoints and uh, see if there are any questions built up on that section. And then I have um, budgeted time in this slide deck to um, to end with, with enough time for some discussion uh, okay. over the whole presentation. Great. The other thing is uh, I'm happy for the PDF of these slides to be available to people either through your website or we can, can also post it uh, at the Shine website. And uh, the, web, the, the, the PDF of the slides comes with an appendix. There's just some extra slides um, for particularly a life cycle assessment practitioner audience. Uh, but I didn't want to kind of get caught in the LCA methodology minutia in today's uh, session. And yet, I wanted to provide that content for people who were interested after the fact. So that's a, sort of an appendix to those slides. Yeah, great. We'll we'll definitely make that available to the through the website as as well as the if you want to do it through Shine, that'd be great. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> real quick intro. Uh, I probably know many of you. I haven't. I, I'm not seeing the list of attendees, but. Um, uh, been uh, in this LCA world for uh, close to 20 years now and um, currently co-directing this initiative, Sustainability and Health Initiative for Net Positive Enterprise at the School of Public Health at Harvard, where I've been teaching LCA since the late 90s and uh, been doing life cycle assessment research and consulting since also mid, mid to late 90s. Um, and today I'm, I'm happy uh, to share with you um, really the, the ideas and methods that are very much the, the center of my focus and passion in the LCA uh, practice, and that's this net positive sustainability. I think the point of departure for this whole frame uh, for me it probably comes from realizing in the early years of getting involved in life cycle assessment and doing what I sometimes call footprint science, um, that everything we buy has a footprint. Every good or service is having a, has a footprint. And um, I look at a day in my life, I see that I wake up and have a warm shower and, a, and uh, some breakfast and then maybe commute to work where there's uh, plenty of electricity being consumed and so on. And uh, come home, eat meals, um, use more hot water, etc. And we're doing similar things if we're fortunate enough um, pretty much all day long every day and uh, this led me to really ask myself and start asking the students at the end of my uh, LCA semester class 
how many of us uh, are feeling that the planet would be better off, ecologically speaking, if we hadn't been born? And when I generally ask that question uh, to people who have given any thought to footprints, whether it's LCA experts and practitioners or just people who have been introduced to the concept, most people kind of give a nervous laugh and, and acknowledge that that's how they feel too. Uh, and to me, this is a terrible um, way to live. Um, it would be terrible to live this way, and it's, it is terrible to feel this way. And so I really set about a bit of a mission to figure out how to make that not the case. Um, and of course, how to not just think and feel differently, but how to actually feel confident and be confident that we uh, have figured out how to live in a way that um, we're doing more good than harm. So that's what uh, this presentation is about. It's about introducing a concept uh, called the handprint, which is the analog, which is analogous, it's sort of the positive counterpart to a footprint. Uh, and uh, just as LCA is, has been uh, footprinting science, I think life cycle assessment can expand a bit and become the science of uh, handprinting as well. And if we make our handprint bigger than our footprint, my suggestion is uh, we're net positive and the planet is better off with us here. Whether that's an individual, a company, a city, uh, any organization or group of people, um, this can be the case. So that's what I'd like to share with you today is, is these ideas, uh, their value and, and uh, potential value and how they work. Um, I'll start by sharing uh, some, some thoughts and results on the power of, of framing uh, or frames and then we'll get into what is a handprint uh, really for a, a person who understands life cycle assessment and understands footprints. I'll give some uh, real examples of uh, hand printing uh, underway, talk briefly about the SHINE initiative at Harvard, and leave time for uh, your questions. I think we're generally operating in a frame of sustainability these days, especially corporate sustainability, organizational sustainability, which has this flavor. Um, companies who are leaders in this space will set goals that look like this. By a certain year we will reduce our, our uh, normalized emissions, in other words our emission intensity per unit of output by some large percentage and our absolute emissions, if we're really lucky, um, companies are setting absolute emission targets that include absolute reductions as well. So they plan to grow but they plan to reduce normalized emissions enough that uh, absolute emissions will also decline a bit. Um, I don't know how you feel about goals like this. I think they probably were a bit uh, encouraging and exciting 20 years ago, but these days we've got a lot of sustainability professionals uh, sort of up to their eyeballs in reporting. Um, these goals uh, have participated in, in sessions in helping companies set such targets, and I know from experience that they're set in a, in a sort of political process that uh, you, you try and find some balance between stakeholders who want much stronger goals and, and uh, uh, C-suite folks who, who are terrified of the goals that the stakeholders are proposing and we somewhere we meet somewhere in the middle but at the end the company is still polluting and we know that every company with these kind of goals is doing that and the, the most we might hope to say is that we have become a slightly smaller part of what's unfortunately becoming a, a larger problem. <clears throat> and the problem really is getting larger. I won't go into it, but uh, of course greenhouse gas uh, concentrations in the atmosphere continue to rise as does sea level and uh, so forth. We, we have um, biodiversity um, continuing uh, tropical deforestation and so on. It, the, really the problems are not only still there, but they're in many cases they're getting worse at accelerating rates. So we know that we need from a scientific point of view, we, we've got to find the strong avenues for stronger action. Uh, this report just came out in the last month or so. Uh, UN Global Compact and Accenture um, interviewed over a thousand CEOs. It's supposedly the largest 
CEO survey on sustainability that's ever been done. And um, the CEOs, it, it's a nice report. You can find it in the web, but the um, nice, I, I should use a better word. It's an informative report. Um, the CEOs uh, uh, think only a third of them roughly believe that uh, the economy is on track to meet necessary sustainability targets. So two-thirds think we're not, and two-thirds also roughly feel that business is not doing enough to meet these targets. Um, at the same time, they see their own efforts to increase sustainability or advance sustainability within their companies as plateauing facing um, a sort of plateau and they're struggling increasingly uh, compared with prior year surveys to make the business case for significant sustainable action. So that's the other side of the problem I'm also really trying to address here. There is a, um, there are a few companies who are starting to wave a slightly different flag um, and this is one that's based on science-based targets or responds to science-based targets. Um, for example, that uh, in order to stabilize the climate, CO2 uh, concentrations need to reach a certain target by a certain year, and that in turn requires emissions to go down by a, a given factor. And so you might, companies are beginning to, to consider, or in some cases, set targets that say, if everyone behaved like us, we would stabilize. Um, but you're still facing uh, maxed out uh, professionals on, on reporting. You still have this political uh, tension and uh, if anything it's gotten worse in the sense that the, the business relevance of these harder targets is uh, harder to uh, maybe sell at the company. And I'm not sure how many of the stakeholders are, are fully energized by these goals and ultimately you're still polluting. Maybe we could just now say we're no longer part of the problem, but has it been solved? <clears throat> Where I'm headed is a frame that uh, enables companies to, to, to credibly set these kind of goals and to actually be able to look at their achievements in a year or two and say, we're healing the planet. There's less carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases in the atmosphere because we're operating. Uh, the oceans are cleaner because we're operating, selling goods and services. There's even more petroleum in the ground because of our company and its activities. And um, at this point, I often ask people how many folks in the room uh, think those goals are impossible. And if it's an honest group of folks, which uh, or a group of folks that feels uh, it's okay to be honest, um, I'll usually hear most people say that uh, that sounds like... Um, fiction. So let's, uh, hopefully by the end of today, you'll share with me a sense that is very possible to, to, to achieve those goals. Not just to set those goals, but credibly achieve them. As you can see, this is a different frame for sustainability. Um, and I want to just mention briefly the power of frames. This is a uh, often used problem to test people's um, creativity and speed with which they can solve a slightly creative problem. So your, your task here is to somehow attach the candle to the wall above the table in such a way that the wax is, when the candle's lit, the wax is not dripping onto the table. I'll let everyone ponder that for 10 seconds more or so. And here's the solution. At least this is a solution. You get the tax out of the box. Uh, you put a few tax through the box into the wall and uh, light the candle, maybe melt a little bit of wax into the bottom of the uh, box here so that you can then set the candle on it and it won't tip over. And uh, you're all set. Now it turns out that people can solve this problem much more quickly if and with higher probability of solving the problem before a deadline, if prior to presenting this problem we show them a video or, or photographs that have a positive effect, maybe it's uh, a comedy or, or smiling children or, or things of that nature, a, a nice nature scene, whereas if we show you um, a negative uh, images or film, maybe with some people getting hurt or violence and those kind of problems, 
you'll be less likely to solve the problem on time and the, the time to solution takes longer. It's maybe surprising, but those are they're very um, often repeated, duplicated results. Um, <clears throat> there's another way to speed up people, and I'll, I'll get back to that issue of uh, positive or negative effect in a moment. But there's another way to speed up the, the time to solution, and that's to simply present the problem this way. It's the same information. We've just taken the tax out of the box explicitly in the first place. People will get the right answer, or will get that solution I showed more quickly, higher probability, if you sh present the same information in a, in a different way. And that, too, uh, is the kind of framing, really, that we're, we're proposing here with um, net positive sustainability. Now, if we frame sustainability as a problem, well, first let me just share that this um, framework for perception, motivation, and action, and the relationship between emotions and motivation and taking actions um, is, well, also something that you find uh, extensively in literature on human behavior and, and motivation. If we frame sustainability as a problem or a crisis, which it's hard not to, right? I shared slides uh, right at the beginning um, with uh, icebergs melting and so on. Um, but it turns out that when we share, uh, when we frame sustainability as a problem or a crisis, um, it grabs our attention, but we are really evolved to grab our attention back as fast as we can. In other words, we can't go around in crisis mode. It's just we're not meant to be, we're not healthy human beings if that's uh, our perceptual mode, our frame of mind. And for these reasons, um, what we tend to do in, in that kind of a context is take action that averts the danger or that we hope averts the danger and move on. Um, we seek safety, quick relief, and if we can't find an action uh, that will give us quick relief, we find other ways to get relief, like ignoring the problem or denying that it's a problem in the first place. Uh, and we certainly see evidence of this behavior all around us. But if we frame sustainability as an opportunity, as promoting flourishing, uh, promoting the flourishing of life, promoting the flourishing of uh, other human beings, present and future, that's a, a frame that I think leads to the same actions but sustains and even builds engagement. That's the kind of activity humans come back to stronger each time they succeed. And that's the kind of action, of course, we need uh, ourselves and our companies, organizations to be engaged in over our lifetimes uh, on sustainability. So that's a new framing that, or that's a way in which the new framing aligns with human nature, but it, it can also align much better with business logic. Um, I think it's safe to say that sustainability as currently framed does a decent job of aligning well with cost and risk reduction and with brand value increases, but it's not aligned, it's at tension with the business imperative to grow, to uh, move into new markets, basically to sell and do more. Um, and it's also, um, we're not really addressing uh, questions in most sustainability forums that I have been able to participate in, the, the fundamental question of do, you know, which products do we really need, product goods or services. There was a very interesting meeting in Sweden uh, this summer at the Lifecycle Management uh, Conference. It was a session on um, positive accounting. And companies, including SKF, Siemens, Axo, Nobel, they shared that <clears throat> when they create a product, a portfolio of products for which they're able to determine the net impact as positive on at least one impact category, and most of these were carbon positive, um, this has huge impacts on the firm. It, it, there's spillover of innovation from that group to the whole firm. Uh, those product portfolios show higher profitability than the other products sold at the company. And um, the experience of people working in sustainability goes from being sort of the bad news people to the heroes, among the heroes at the company. 
And the um, chief of sustainability officer for SKF gave a keynote at the end of the conference where he said, what KPI do you think we use, uh, sustainability KPI do you think we use on those product portfolios? Is it CO2 emissions? Is it kilograms or gallons of water? No, it's dollars of revenue. Uh, because once we've determined that those products are net beneficial for the environment and human beings, the best thing we can do for the planet, or one of the good things we can do for the planet, is just sell more of them. And that's a, obviously a pure alignment of sustainability and, uh, and business uh, goals if we can achieve it. Now, these same companies, as well as uh, accounting firms, uh, NGOs in the room, concluded the session by saying, uh, we're excited by this, it has a ton of potential, but we've got to have some credible methods, and we've got to get some standardized methods for assessing positive impacts and comparing them with our negative impacts. One more business uh, alignment nugget here. Uh, Professor Teresa Amable at the Harvard Business School has looked at how companies succeed, and she finds that ultimately depends on motivated, committed, creative, workforce, and that in turn requires that employees, not just as a sort of um, a bonus, but it actually requires that employees have a strong inner work life, meaning that they have positive emotions at work on a frequent and, and predominant basis, they have strong internal or intrinsic motivation, and they feel favorable toward uh, their colleagues and the work itself. And all of this fundamentally rests on them being empowered to succeed and feel a sense of tangible progress at work that has meaning to them. Uh, this is a great uh, little read if you uh, are looking for your next airport book. I recommend this one. And working on um, net positive sustainability, I think, really uh, is, is a perfect example of the kind of work uh, that um, that Teresa Mable has found through research uh, in in a large number of companies will lead to business success. So, uh, Jim, let me just check uh, briefly with you for a moment, see if any uh, key questions have cropped up that I should hit now or or move along. Uh, nothing to date, Greg. So let's try to catch those at the end at this point. Perfect. Perfect. So. Um, what is a handprint? Well, and how could you possibly be net positive if everything we buy uh, and do or everything we produce has a footprint? Well, the answer is that we also have handprints. Those are positive impacts that we cause to happen relative to business as usual. Um, Time Magazine featured handprints last year as uh, an idea that they said would change your life and that would be well, that'll be very great if it, uh, if it happens. I think it's too soon to say it's changing your life, but uh, here's hoping. You're already creating handprints if you, for example, are helping your customer reduce their footprint. I think uh, LCA consultants are probably a natural to think this way. Uh, we hope that our work is helping our, our clients uh, reduce their footprint. And in some cases, we can calculate what those impacts are. But so can uh, many of the companies using LCA to redesign their products. Um, in so doing, they're reducing their foot, the footprint of their customers relative to business as usual. Um, if you inform or inspire your customers to use your product in a more sustainable fashion, that too is a handprint. Uh, if you work in your supply chain and um, require or induce your suppliers to make improvements, uh, those improvements are part of your handprint. And if you share innovation uh, with other companies or even with other individuals, um, we launched a website uh, a couple of years ago, handprinter.org, where you can uh, actually try out a tool for um, personal handprinting. And um, so net positive means basically giving more than you take, handprint bigger than footprint. Um, and here's a real example, uh, Corporation Eaton, which uh, serves aerospace and other transportation industries with its products. They, uh, they make components for engines, for example, 
Um, they've been pursuing footprint reduction for years. Their engineers are uh, reported to be not too inspired by that frame, but they keep plugging away at it. But um, the, the R&D department realized recently that if they fully deployed one new innovative product they recently developed uh, by the U.S. Army, that would lead to footprint reductions, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions equal to three times the entire corporate GHG footprint. Uh, and that's just one product. Um, and the, the sustainability officer in that R&D division told me it, it, it makes us think maybe our focus in sustainability is missing something. And I think it is. It's missing the potential handprints uh, that they can uh, create. And it turns out that's a much more powerful lever for that company to bring about sustainability than reducing its footprint. I like to uh, mention three steps for uh, handprint creation. And the first step is, in fact, to address your own footprint. So it's not, it, handprints are not an alternative to footprints. It's not like, okay, everybody stop thinking about your footprint and start thinking about your handprint. Instead, it's as you think about footprint reduction, please add a tangible concept of handprints. And so the first way to uh, create a handprint, in fact, the, sm the best first step is to reduce your footprint. It's best because you're well positioned to do that. Uh, you learn a lot in, in reducing your own footprint. And uh, you need to walk the talk. Um, but it's also tragic to stop there. Um, no matter which organization you work for, I think it's safe to say that your organization's footprint is uh, dwarfed by humanity's footprint. That's certainly true for each one of us as uh, individual consumers. And by the way, virtually everything I'm saying here applies equally to people and households as it does to uh, companies. So step one for a, a person wanting to green their lifestyle is definitely footprint reduction. But because our footprints are dwarfed by humanity's footprint, it's tragic when we stop there. It's, we're essentially constraining the good we can do by the harm we're currently doing. And why introduce such a, uh, such a limiting constraint. So step two is help anybody and everybody reduce their footprint. Um, this gives you a much larger, if you like, sandbox in which to operate, uh, space in which to play. Um, it uh, gives you access to more low-hanging fruit if your organization has been reducing your footprint for a while. Many organizations are, are just starting on that journey, if at all. And um, frankly, there are cultural uh, wisdom reasons to also essentially uh, share uh, the wealth of uh, your ideas and inspiration on, um, and your energy and your resources on footprint production. And finally, you can also create handprints in ways that really have nothing to do with footprints. Uh, bringing something positive into the world, like planting a tree, building a school. Um, these are restorative or generative actions. They're not really footprint reductions at all. I think it's a, tw it's a strange twist to try and characterize those as footprint reductions. They're, they're benefits. They're, uh, they're bringing uh, something good into the world. On, and, and doing that on a sustainability dimension is a third way to uh, create or grow your handprint. There's another aspect to handprinting. It's intensely social. Um, it companies, in order to really uh, take sustainability to scale, we need to uh, harness our intense social interconnectivity. Um, and so, as I say here, design for ripple effects. That's how we change the world. And there are many ways to design for ripple effects. One is to share innovation to the maximum extent possible. Um, another is to engage your customers to create handprints and, frankly, to engage them to engage their friends. So you harness your customers as the front line in this diagram, and they, in turn, uh, spread the idea out to folks who may not be your customers. But if you've stimulated that wave of positive change, then um, the third and fourth tier benefits are also part of your uh, handprint. Um, 
Another way to design for ripple effects is to capture part of what's often an economic savings associated with eco-efficiency or sustainability and reinvest it, some of that in more hand printing. So uh, I'll, uh, we may get a question at the end about the rebound effect. What happens when people save money by being more ecological? Don't they just respend it? Well, you can actually make the rebound effect bounce in a sustainable direction through that principle. Let me give three concrete examples of hand printing underway. Uh, one by Owens Corning, uh, another store level hand printing and foot printing by Lululemon, and then uh, some school, some activity in schools. Um, Owens Corning is actually assessing, they've worked with us in the Shine program over the last year to assess their corporate footprint on a very comprehensive set of environmental and human impact, health and well-being dimensions. Um, and then they're also beginning to assess the handprints of changes to business as usual that they're able to bring about. Uh, the work that they're already doing and new initiatives that they're, that they're launching. Um, that includes working with suppliers to reduce uh, footprints. Of course, it includes their own on-site energy efficiency improvements or increased use of recycled content, uh, but also stimul stimulating more uh, use of insulation uh, by customers. Uh, obviously, that's closely aligned with uh, their business goals. And they're exploring further uh, opportunities to grow their handprints such that ultimately they become net positive on as many impact dimensions as possible. Um, we, we tend to have, um, we, we tend to operate in, in hand printing and foot printing with the same set of endpoints as we do in, uh, well, in hand printing we look at the same endpoints as in foot printing. And I don't tend to advocate for trade-offs. In other words, we're so climate positive it's okay that we're, we're negative on toxics. Instead, the paradigm is try to get uh, net positive on as many impact categories as you can. You may achieve net positive on climate first, um, and that's good, but then you want to pursue water and toxics and other impacts. So we've looked at uh, human health and, and these other endpoints here, including working conditions, economic development, community, but also more traditional environmental um, uh, sustainability endpoints. This is actually hypothetical data from an earlier slide, um, but uh, we're, we've now um, completed some work with Owens Corning where they're able to, to uh, calculate their footprint in some of their handprint uh, in, as a result of 2012 data, and they'll be updating that in 2013. So watch for um, some reporting on this from Owens Corning in their upcoming sustainability reporting. Um, these days with the buzz around shared value, it's not unique for companies to talk about the good that they're doing, but what I think is powerful and more, more rare, if not unique, uh, is when a company stacks the good that they're doing next to their footprint and ultimately sets out a target of making that handprint larger than the footprint. And that's really a powerful way, I think, to for this shared value paradigm to become fully credible uh, and legitimate in, uh, in stakeholders' eyes. That we're, yes, we're trying to grow our, our shared value or our handprint, but we're also comparing it to our footprint and we hold ourselves accountable to being net positive. Lululemon has uh, a very decentralized uh, store empowerment culture and they've actually uh, piloted the use of handprinting we, we took the hand printer web uh, tool that you can find at handprinter.org and we adopted it to um, uh, stores. We added uh, more impact categories and we uh, actually collected action ideas from the store employees, modeled them with life cycle assessment and made them available to the stores. And the stores can um, grow their hand print by taking actions. Uh, but also by adding new actions and sharing those with other stores. So you can grow this handprint and ultimately it uh, filled, the hand becomes fully green when your handprint's larger than your footprint and you grow it by taking action at your store and sharing good ideas with other stores. 
Finally, uh, we have an exciting project that's launching it with schools here in New England and meant to spread uh, around the world. And it's um, engaging middle school students in hand printing. Um, Owens Corning has partnered with us by giving three, donating 300 water heater blankets. Those are insulation wraps for a hot water tank uh, in a home. And um, they've donated 300 of those to a school, which in turn shares them with uh, residents in the community and uh, says to the uh, recipient, you know, this is a gift from our school. It'll save you $5 a month here in New England. Uh, for years, so you could save five hundred dollars over the life of this blanket. We would ask you to share back nine months of savings or forty five dollars to the school, and with that we're going to uh, achieve something on site as a fundraiser. We'll raise about uh, four thousand dollars at the school, but we'll also purchase two more water blankets in your name to pass on to two more schools who will pass on to each two more schools and so forth. And we've got this exponential growth dynamic built in so that ultimately the, uh, the handprint of this project after 10 rounds uh, could exceed the footprint of Owens Corning. It'll raise millions of dollars for schools um, and uh, reduce uh, many tons. Uh, I've done the calculations, just don't have memorized of all the potential uh, sustainability benefits that this will bring as well. Now, Owens Corning is a participant in SHINE, and I'll mention real briefly what SHINE is about uh, before closing here. You can learn more at the, uh, the web address there. Basically, SHINE is about uh, engaging a community of companies to help us blaze trails in this net positive sustainability space. So we're communicating, testing, refining uh, a framework for assessing net positive, a framework for helping companies assess their environmental footprints and their handprints on those same dimensions. Um, we're also looking at unconventional but very potent pathways from co company operations to health and well-being. Um, essentially, the work experience, for example, is a very powerful and neglected uh, pathway from corporate uh, management and operation to health for their employees. Uh, employees, families, and the community. So <clears throat> SHINE is about blazing trails with our uh, participating partner companies in both dimensions and um, road testing this framework. Um, they share information, uh, lessons learned, et cetera, uh, among each other and help us deliver resources to uh, promote hand printing uh, freely and globally. Uh, remember that um, this, this call by the companies at the Lifecycle Management Conference this summer that we need credible standardized methods. Um, SHINE is sort of like the past 2050 standard from the UK came out before WRI released its um, scope 3 and product level footprint, uh, carbon footprint standards. And I witnessed in that uh, episode that um, the past 2050 by being out there and in practice uh, ahead of time had a huge positive influence on the shape that the standards eventually took uh, from WRI. We have the same goal it, with SHINE. Uh, I think standards will come. I know WRI, uh, we've been actually discussing uh, synergistic collaboration with WRI on this now for over a year, and they're starting to look at uh, possibly launching a standardization effort around positive impacts. Um, and so with SHINE, we seek to uh, blaze some trails there, demonstrate what's possible, uh, and expand uh, the sense of not only what's possible, but what's been shown as practical by companies so that uh, those standards can be the best they can be. Over the next year, uh, we basically um, host webinars that focus on individual aspects of the SHINE framework. So there's one coming up uh, next week on environmental footprinting, comprehensive environmental footprinting, and then we look at hand printing uh, in early next year. Um, likewise, social footprinting and social hand printing, and then the, the third uh, set of pathways, their health and well-being footprints and uh, health and well-being uh, hand prints. We have just one meeting a year face-to-face -to, -face to help uh, 
sort of accommodate everyone's busy travel calendars and also keep our own travel footprint as small as we can. Uh, but one face-to-face -face, uh, collaborative discussion meeting uh, we also found um, is, is really powerful. Um, the founding members of Shine so far are uh, these four um, leading companies. And um, I should also cl I'll then close by saying we're, um, it, remember where I mentioned walk the talk is critical. Uh, and we see that uh, ourselves here at Shine and, and thankfully at, uh, at Harvard University, um, where the Office of Sustainability has approached us to start piloting handprinting and, in fact, piloting application of the Shine framework to look at three separate centers. The Center for Health and the Global Environment, where Shine is located and where I work, is one of those centers. And two other centers at Harvard are also piloting uh, this spring uh, the Shine framework. Um, and we're also, thanks to a grant from the uh, Office of Sustainability, uh, looking to launch something we call the Handprint Generator. It's a web-based, um, it, it serves two functions. It crowdsources the uh, generation and sharing of handprint ideas themselves, and it also crowdsources uh, assessment, open modeling and assessment, transparent modeling and assessment of the impacts of those actions. So if you think of a sort of just as uh, Wikipedia invites humanity to write itself uh, an encyclopedia, um, the handprint generator is uh, inviting humanity to share and assess handprint actions. And uh, that's critical. Um, we've experienced in our own uh, in our own work uh, with uh, Lululemon on the store-based front that uh, there were many more ideas bubbling up from the stores than we could um, affordably uh, model in the project. You know, you have to collect the ideas and then uh, perform an LCA of them. And uh, so the handprint generator is meant to really bypass bottlenecks to uh, the assessment as well as the generation of handprinting ideas. and be usable by uh, software tools, including HandPrinter, but any software tools that are helping companies or individuals understand their footprint and ways to grow a HandPrint. So thankfully, we still got uh, some good time here for discussion, and I uh, look forward to uh, hearing your questions. Great. Thank you, Greg. It's great, uh, great topic, great uh, presentation as well. Uh, let you uh, catch your breath and get a drink of water or something. Uh, while we're doing that, I will uh, answer one question that uh, popped in here that I actually answered offline, but just so everyone knows, just remind everyone that um, the presentation will be available, the recorded version here, um, on our website. That's earthshift.com slash brown dash bag. Um, so you can pick that up, and typically it takes me an hour or so to to get it up there, but so by the end of the day, we'll have it up there. And then, uh, as Greg had mentioned earlier, uh, I'll also post the, a PDF of the the presentation as well, so you can you can leverage that as well as you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, so another question that came in here, Greg, while you were talking, and I share this one as well, uh, and it's really how do I get my middle school, uh, the middle mm -hmm. school of my community, involved in that in the in your project with Corning? That's a really amazing project. Wonderful. Thanks for asking. Well, Jim, I'm happy to tell you that your middle school, I've, I've already visited. Uh, All right. <laughs> Jim and I both live in the same town here in York, Maine, um, and I had a chance to sit down with uh, some science teachers there, and they're, they're really enthusiastic about integrating this into their curriculum. Um, and incidentally, we I didn't mention, but we're working also with the education school at Harvard, um, some grad students there and Professor Tina Grotzer, are, uh, she teaches, uh, well, she helps develop and does research and, and curriculum development on teaching complex forms of causation, including causation at a distance, the kind of things that, that are central to both handprint, footprints and handprints. And so uh, we're working with them to develop effective, uh, hopefully easy to use uh, curriculum materials around both footprinting and handprinting. Um, I would say go ahead and just the simplest thing to do is to email me at that address to ask about how your uh, schools can be um, 
kind of one of the first to have this passed on to you. We've, it looks like we're, in fact, it's Boston Latin School, the first uh, public uh, high school in the country, I guess, um, <clears throat> which is the one uh, launching the project. And they will pass it on to uh, York Middle School and uh, another lucky middle school, and then there'll be four more and so <laughs> forth. So love to hear from folks. Uh, we will get a web page about this project into handprinter.org pretty soon, but for now, feel free to contact me uh, personally on that. Oh, that's great. Um, it, it, you had touched another question that came in, and just want to let people know that uh, if you do have questions, you can go ahead and type them into the question pane, um, we'll, and we'll sort of get to them as we can here, as many as we can. Um, another question that came in, and you had come back to it a little bit, uh, and it was really in regards to sort of paraphrasing a little bit here. Um, the, the coming out of the session in, in Sweden uh, at LCM, you had mentioned, mentioned that organizations were looking for methods. Um, mm -hmm. And you had talked a little bit about how um, it's important to get out of, in front a little bit to kind of drive some of those methods. But I just wanted to know if you had any additional insight in, into those methods and, and kind of, you know, anything concrete for that folks can take advantage of. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jim. In fact, I meant to sort of show this page to, um, this is, this is unfortunately a book that um, not many people have bought. It's kind of one of those expensive books. Uh, it came out this year, but it has a chapter where I lay out the handprint methodology, kind of handprinting 101. Um, and uh, I checked, and it's available at Amazon.com, for example. Um, I do, uh, I'm, I'm eager to get an article into the Journal of LCA that sort of updates that a little bit uh, and expands it for a life cycle audience. Um, the, I also mention here that uh, in Shine we um, <coughs> will be producing this spring a guide to environmental footprinting and handprinting. Um, and our intent with Shine is to make those resources actually test them and get uh, our, our member input as we develop them, but then make them publicly available as well. Um, so resources coming, I guess I would say, and in the meantime, this chapter uh, would hopefully be a good place uh, to start. Okay, great. Uh, another question that, that sort of references back to the beginning of your discussion, and it really talks to the the Accenture uh, study that was released and just mm -hmm. trying to get your perspective on the sentiment that uh, sustainability initiatives have plateaued uh, that, mm -hmm. that the CEOs are, are, are saying and just kind of get your thoughts on, on what is driving that or, or that whether that's perception or that's that's reality. Mm -hmm. You know the the survey uh, write-up says that um, Although the CEOs believe that there is strong business value uh, to be had through sustainability, that um, there, the number of CEOs who say they're having difficulty making that case within their organization has risen steadily from the 2010 survey to the most recent. And it, it's, it's up to something close to 40% now say that they um, they're actually having trouble. Even though they believe it brings business value, they don't have the alignment. Um, now the report goes on to say that uh, it, it sort of says, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but that um, the cost reduction due diligence kind of frame on sustainability is the old one and that you can you get better alignment with business value if you have uh, kind of shared value creation. And so it, you know, it points in the shared value um, direction. Um, but there are uh, other, when you read in, in depth uh, in the report, it also talks about uh, employee engagement on sustainability. And so um, to me, I mean, I, I think this, this is, of course, how we read reports. We look for <laughs> affirming uh, information. But to me, I think we can, we can help businesses with three things through a net positive sustainability framework. We can help employee engagement. And one great way to create handprints is to just turn your employees loose on handprinting. Um, another 
and, and frankly, I, to tell you some stories of engagement from Owens Corning, uh, maybe uh, if we have time. Um, another is the credibility uh, that comes from putting your, your shared value or, or you know, societal value creation next to your footprint. Um, and the third is the business alignment uh, that comes from essentially reshaping some of your products so that uh, ultimately the way you operate and the products that you're selling are net positive. And uh, once that's the case, again, business is 100% is aligned with, um, with sustainability. So th those were some of the reasons that the report cites as uh, obstacles. Okay, that's great. Um, another question going back to looking at hand printing in, in your, your site that you had mentioned, uh, that was from an individual perspective. The question is, you know, how do businesses get involved uh, with mm -hmm. hand printing? Mm -hmm. uh, great, it's true. That website um, only uh, addresses uh, individual users, kind of a citizen, and it was a, it was a first beta. Uh, I mentioned that we have this uh, Owens Corning Sorry, there's a Lululemon uh, example. We, we created a first uh, version in a pilot with Lululemon, uh, and we're looking to actually run a new round of that uh, to take lessons learned from that first pilot, further improve this. This is really relevant to any retail uh, business or, or a business which has retail operations. Um, so anybody who's got a retail operation, and, and by the way, uh, it could also I would say commercial operations, and so uh, this is, with just a few tweaks, it's pretty relevant to uh, Harvard as well. We, we might eventually uh, have a university version of hand printing. So if that's relevant to you, that's one way to biz for business to get involved. And then, more generally, we really intend Shine as a, uh, as a useful way that companies can, can both learn and uh, participate and also help uh, promote uh, sort of the world's ability to, to advance on, um, on hand printing and, and uh, net positive. And there are, there's a basic membership option uh, through Shine um, where you participate in these webinars and the annual meeting and get advanced access to the reports and so forth. Um, and then there's what we call the network level um, where you actually work with us to help us advance uh, one aspect or another of the Shine infrastructure. So if I if I look at um, the folks involved uh, now, um, Johnson and Johnson and has is working with us uh, in 2014 to help advance the health and well-being aspects of Shine. Uh, Owens Corning worked with us to help advance the the framework for accounting last year, and they're shifting to also now uh, help us advance on health and well-being. And Dassault Systems, uh, which makes SolidWorks among uh, uh, other uh, software uh, tools, is going to work with us on the, um, on the advancement of the Shine framework to focus specifically on the role of technological innovation in creating handprints. So those are, uh, Shine is, is definitely another way for folks to, uh, to engage. Excellent. Well, once again, Greg, thanks for a great presentation, great content. Uh, again, I remind everyone that we will be posting this recording online. Uh, I also want to let everyone know and, and uh, put a little plug for next week's session uh, on December 11th. Uh, really interesting, good tie-in to this week. Uh, next week we'll talk about some emerging technology innovations um, as project perspective pathways uh, to a sustainable future. So I think a really nice tie-in to what Greg talked about today. So feel free to, to register for that session as well if you haven't already. Once again, thanks everyone for attending, and we hope to talk to you soon. Thanks again, Greg. Thank you, Jim. Take care.